Good morning, afternoon or evening to everyone watching. And first of all, I'd like to thank ITIC and Tax Notes International for asking us to give this webinar. Um, let's start off with some introductions. My name's Liz Allen. I spent over 35 years working for the UK's Indirect Tax Revenue Authority, including 10 years as head of either a VAT or an excise division before becoming a consultant um, for ITIC and others in 2009. Since then, I've delivered training courses and seminars in, in VAT and excise, both for Eurasian authorities and for African authorities. My colleague, David Child, uh, is also from a UK background, covering both VAT and customs, but he's worked for most of the last 25 years on improving tax administration in developing countries, mainly in Africa. I don't know if you want to add anything at this point, David? I mean, no, I mean, I mean, only evening or, or afternoon or morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Okay, well, today we're talking about taxation of SMEs to support post-COVID-19 economic recovery. We've drawn on the work of several revenue experts and what we're talking about today reflects the thoughts of many of us in the revenue world. Today's webinar will look first at the context and then I'll explore some indirect tax policy and administration options for supporting existing taxpayers. David will explain some options for direct tax support for existing taxpayers. And then we'll look at encouraging economic growth in SMEs to aid recovery once the COVID-19 business disruption has subsided. Finally, David will present our conclusions and recommendations. So, on to slide two, please. So, starting off with the background, which we all know, and I'd like to welcome uh, Ben now. Uh, we started because we didn't know whether you'd be uh, joining us or not or when. So forgive me for having made the introductions, Ben. I'll stop here if you want to say anything more. No, perhaps we haven't got sound on yet. So I'll He is on him. mute. I can see that. He oh, is on mute. He's on mute. No, still nothing. Oh, yes, here we are. Hello. Hi, so sorry about that. I uh, had some technical difficulties on my side, so my apologies. Okay, well, I've done, I've introduced us, um, and I was just I was just starting on the on the slides. But if you want to say something else first to uh, introduce the whole event, please go ahead. Sure, absolutely. Uh, again, my apologies to everyone for uh, my tardiness. Uh, I just would like to introduce myself, uh, Ben Willis, contributing editor with Tax Notes. As Liz alluded to, I'm sure we're here to, to discuss post-COVID-19 tax policy today uh, based on uh, Liz and David's uh, excellent paper on this topic. Uh, today is our last of eight webinars on uh, post-COVID government responses and uh, obviously they're designed to spur economic growth and help facilitate tax issues uh, among countries who are dealing with this. Specifically, we're gonna be focusing on SMEs, which uh, Liz probably already teed up. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and let them continue with the discussion and uh, intermittently ask questions as we proceed. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Okay, thank you, Ben. I'm so, I'm so glad you could make it. Uh, Thanks. Back to the context, well, we all know uh, COVID-19 has had uh, a global impact. It's resulted not only in the tragic loss of lives, but also in a dramatic reduction, both of tax revenues and economic development. Whilst countries have incurred large debts to pay for lockdowns, for compensation and to fund healthcare, less affluent governments will have been struggling to fund essential services during the pandemic and all governments now need revenue inflows, especially as the cost of some public services, such as healthcare, will have increased. Meanwhile, businesses are desperate for cash flow to survive this seemingly endless pandemic. And fiscal policy needs to complement government support, but 
Now, how are we going to get the additional revenue that we need? Next slide, please. So, why are we bothered about SMEs? Why are they important? Well, whatever is done in terms of fiscal policy in relation to businesses, large, medium and small, it'll be important to ensure first that the worst of the pandemic is over and that there are green shoots of economic recovery before considering imposing any new or higher taxes on the SME sector. It'll also be important to bear in mind that some sectors such as hospitality, tourism, and personal services, such as hairdressing, have suffered more than others. So a first action should be to analyze the impact of lockdowns on the SMEs, including the self-employed, in the different trade sectors, and perhaps also according to location. I say that because anecdotal evidence suggests that because of the increase in office workers working from home instead of in city center offices, small businesses in city centers may have suffered rather more than small businesses in towns and rural or semi-rural locations. On the other hand, the pandemic has also seen a dramatic increase in online shopping and home deliveries. A number of small businesses have started offering delivery services bookable online for everything, ranging from restaurant meals to pharmaceutical products, organic and artisanal produce, and even garden plants. So, Armed with a better understanding of the economic impact of the pandemic on small businesses in the different trade sectors and locations in their country, administrators can better frame both financial support and fiscal policy for the years immediately ahead. Liz, quick question for you. Uh, is there any sort of a universal definition for small or middle-sized uh, enterprises? No, unfortunately, there's no universal definition. Um, I think you'll appreciate that the GDP and cost of living vary in each country. And the definition of an SME in a developing country, such as, for example, Malawi, encompasses micro businesses with one to four employees, small businesses with five to 20 employees, and medium businesses with 21 to 100 employees. South Africa uses annual turnover of less than 64 million rand or capital assets of less than 10 million rand or less than 200 employees while the uk treats businesses with less than 250 employees as smes so most countries though uh, the revenue authorities do segment the large businesses for specialist audit treatment so Obviously, the SMEs uh, must constitute the rest of the businesses who are required to register and pay tax. I'm sorry, but I can't give you anything more universal than that. <laughs> no, that's uh, very helpful. It seems like it uh, differs uh, greatly. So uh, thank you very much for that explanation. Okay, next slide, please. So what taxes are we talking about? Um, well, there's quite a long list revenue streams that have been adversely affected as a result of the COVID-19 lockdowns and the subsequent reductions in economic activity. I won't read the list, but you can see uh, that it illustrates just how widespread the impact will have been. Of course, there are some sectors uh, that were deemed essential, such as provision of food and beverages, and those providing delivery and essential public health services, and many of those will have benefited from increased profits, especially where online ordering has been involved. And certainly in the UK, I think that's the case for uh, the major uh, supermarket shops. So in my part of the UK, I've seen a tremendous increase in delivery vans and bikes, as well as the advent of new organic and fresh, uh, farm fresh or online ordering and home delivery services. So is there scope for perhaps new taxes or higher taxes to take advantage of the business sectors that have flourished? I'll talk about this a bit further on. And uh, yes, of course, there's always scope to improve compliance with existing tax regulations through an analysis and understanding of the current tax gaps, accompanied by improved revenue and customs administration and a risk-based approach to compliance. But uh, in the interest of brevity, 
I'm not going to be talking today about the components of good administration and enforcement or risk-based compliance management, as these are topics worthy of a separate event. Next slide, please. So now, well, what options do revenue authorities, do governments have for supporting existing taxpayers? And I'm sure that you'll, you'll be familiar with uh, many of these. Looking in more detail at these options that can be considered for all taxes due from SMEs, each jurisdiction will need to research the impact to its economy and the cost to the revenue of each of them. Um, I'm taking just a few of these. If there is, for example, to be a payment grace period for the hardest hit, it would be important to be able to identify the individual businesses and suspend the collection process for the agreed time period just for those traders. If not, you, you may end up um, giving uh, giving away money to those who do not really um, need it because they're not the hardest hit. Uh, similarly, if you're talking about providing time to pay for uh, businesses that are struggling with their cash flow, uh, again, if possible, it'd be best to target the individual businesses in the trade sectors. Um, I know in the UK, the, the uh, line taken was to ask businesses to apply it and then somehow it was decided whether or not you were eligible. Um, if it involves IT programming, this could be both difficult, expensive and time consuming. The introduction of flexible payment plans might apply where tax is paid over a long period, say at least a year, and as and when possible, providing the quarterly or annual payment totals are actually met. There can be deferment of payment dates for VAT, for example, say from 21 to 51 days after the end of the tax period. And whilst I'm sure businesses would appreciate automatic and rapid tax repayments or refunds, obviously there needs to be some set parameters to avoid opening the floodgates for all sorts of repayment frauds. Then how about using a carrot rather than a stick, perhaps giving a discount to a taxpayer in one of the hard hit sectors who managed to make the payments in full and on time. And another possibility is for government to provide a subsidy credit to the hardest hit SMEs to enable them to draw upon this sum in order to pay any taxes due. Many of the options involve analysing data by trade sector, size of turnover, location, in order to identify the hardest hit taxpayers, and then adjusting IT programming to ensure that particular taxpayers can obtain the relief. The options that can be carried out without those difficulties are limited. It'll also be difficult to set definite timescales for reliefs since the duration and full impact of the pandemic on future business activities is still largely a matter of guesswork. For small amounts of tax payments, credit card payments might be an attractive option for taxpayers. And of course, for all taxpayers, taxpayer services need to be enhanced to provide speedy notification of proposals and how to access them, including the provision of web-based services, call centers, and even face-to-face, -face, uh, socially distanced advice where possible uh, and appropriate. But this is another issue for revenue authorities at present because they too are suffering from uh, staff having, uh, having to isolate, not being able to come into uh, city centre offices, not being able to travel in the way they used to. So it's difficult too for revenue authorities to provide the sort of taxpayer services that the businesses need. Next slide, please. And for indirect taxes, there are a few options here of things that might be, might be done, customs duties, reductions in duty for some sectors, but they may not be possible um, under regional external tariffs. 
excise and environmental taxes. Yes, these are more likely to be under a domestic uh, legislation, but then the decisions on whether or not to make any reductions in goods may be subject to a specific structure of, of, for the tax. And it'll be important to bear in mind that if the tax rate is reduced, there's bound to be an impact on health or environment. So perhaps VAT is the sector with the most options available. Before deciding on the way forward, governments will need to research the potential impact of each, both on revenue collection and on economic survival and development of the SMEs. Some of the options would require an IT change that may be difficult or expensive to develop and implement. Where possible, there's no reason why more than one of the options shouldn't be applied for a spe specified period. Though again, it'll be difficult to gauge exactly what would be the appropriate period since progress or otherwise of the pandemic over the next year is unknown. And uh, for, in some countries, uh, there's a general sales tax instead of VAT. And I know that in the States with your federated system, you have state taxes. So um, I don't think we have time to go into it for all of that, but I think you can see that there are uh, read acrosses to the GST and state taxes. For the next slides, I'm going to hand over to my partner, David. And I have to say first that I owe David an awful lot for everything he's taught me, particularly about the indirect taxation challenges in developing countries. So next slide, please, and over to you, David. Well, I, I you mean, thank you, Liz. I am sure I've learned a lot as well. I mean, I mean, both in developing countries and 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 actually other countries. Um, I mean, income tax, I mean, now. And I am not an income tax man. I, I, I am a VAT and customs person, but I have played on income tax in a few places. Um, in, you know, income tax at its basic level is a tax on profits, isn't it? So if you don't make a profit, there is actually I mean, no income tax. And for a large number of SMEs in the last year, I mean, things have been so bad and they are obviously, I mean, still continuing that I mean no profit is likely so in a way on income tax I mean in this year it is all pretty academic because there will be no tax payable but if there is tax payable um, there are various things that I mean could be done to help I mean smaller businesses actually in affected sectors you can obviously change the, the, the individual headline rates or the bands or, 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 or thresholds. And I mean, I would like to see, and I would strongly recommend that, you know, that it would be an ideal opportunity. I mean, now with, I mean, only a small number of businesses actually paying tax to take as many small businesses out of the tax net as you can. Because if you do that, I mean, it is obviously, I mean, increasing profitability for those businesses in, in the medium and longer term. But it is also helping tax administration in that lots of small businesses are, in fact, a burden to them. I mean, a, and, and if they're out of the tax out of the tax net, it will obviously help them in the future in terms of redirecting manpower to more revenue raising activities. Um, in, your income tax tends to work with a combination of advance payments, some I mean, stage payments in year, and and also a balancing payment. I mean that I I I mean at end of year. So if payments have been made in advance, they could be refunded. And the timelines for, for advance payments, you know, could be changed as well, or for stage payments. For I mean, sectors where there are real issues, like like hospitality, as you mentioned, um, you, you could I mean just assume I'm in a nil overall profit this year, and just. I mean, effectively, I mean, effectively abandon income tax. I mean, I mean, over for a particular year, 
But as we're all aware, the, I mean, pandemic, you know, I mean, is still here. And we're almost 12 months in. So it isn't just going to be one tax year. It will probably be two tax years because I think our best guess, if we had our crystal ball, would be that there will be an impact of the the day some pandemic, I mean, through to later in 2021. I mean, maybe even end of 21 or into even 2022. It is, you know, it is a grim prospect, as as everyone knows. One idea I've seen in a few countries is the idea of allowing a, 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 a tax return to actually cover a two-year period. Now, that will depend on the tax arrangements in each individual country, but it could be a tax period that covers the year, I mean, in advance of, 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 of the COVID and also our current year, or it could be this year and also a following one. It would be a smaller amount of paperwork, but it would also help on cash flow. In the longer term, we need to look at growth and investment. I mean, of I mean, of SMEs, and you, and almost all income tax systems allow losses to be carried forward, but there are sometimes restrictions. So maybe those could be looked at, and things like I mean, depreciation allowances for when businesses start investing again. I mean, allow you can get a hundred percent. I mean, depreciation allowances, or 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 actually fifty percent, or whatever allowance for the first year or two for individual sectors. I mean, on the other side, as Liz mentioned, I mean, I mean, countries are desperate. I'm, I mean, actually, for tax for revenues now. And they need to, I mean, fund essential services, um, especially health services. So for those businesses who have done extremely well, I mean, maybe the income tax rate ought to be increased as a revenue raising measure. I mean, next slide, please. I mean, other parts of, of, of of income tax include the income tax on individuals or on employees and the there you could be more generous if you want to stimulate expenditure it is probably not quite the right, right time yet but at some point after the pandemic i i mean i think i mean countries will want to try to encourage sme growth so if you had, I mean, I mean, smaller taxes on, um, I you mean, actually on income, they will be more, I mean, available for expenditure. Um, th- 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 there are often advanced payments, I mean, actually on, I mean, income tax actually collected through withholding tax. And you could s- suspend those if they apply on imports, on professional fees, on property rents, and maybe the other sectors as well. But it will obviously depend on the tax structure in, I mean, individual countries. I mean, I hope that's clear. I'm just trying to be, I mean, brief here because I, you know, I could spend all day talking about withholding taxes, and I'm sure that. You are not interested in that extent. Right. Let us move on. I mean, next slide, please. Where do we go next? I mean, obviously, you want to encourage recovery for both tax and customs. As I mean, as regards all, um, I, 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 I mean, all SMEs in the future. So, how do you try and get them to, I mean, grow? I mean, so, so that 
in due course, you will get a, a greater amount of 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 I mean tax or customs revenue. You know, I mean, I mean, basically strengthening every I'm um, I'm in every individual economy. So one way of doing that is to try to make it easier for people to undertake business. I mean, especially small businesses. So how do we reduce compliance costs? And there is a list of, I mean, half a dozen things there. There's a, a great raft of regulations which affect small business. And they seem to be getting, I mean, I mean, every year, I mean, more onerous. Um, we always speak about making things easier and simpler. But in practice, the regulations appear to get, I mean, more and more extensive. And obviously on tax, we can simplify the requirements for, 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 for I mean, for, for, for registration. We can have, I mean, simpler taxes for small businesses. Um, if we allow, I mean, electronic access, you know, um, for all of our tax processes from I mean, registration to online filing, to answering questions, answering queries, helplines, and, and, and actually also payment. I mean, it will mean that small businesses have, have, I mean, have got more time to concentrate on their business as opposed to going into the tax offices and so on. And obviously you can look at penalties in order to encourage, I mean, voluntary compliance. So, the, 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 I mean, the, that is about a carrot and a stick. I mean, next slide. So we now move on to customs and and actually as Liz and Mami mentioned, if you have regional agreements, if if you're part of a regional, I mean, I mean, I'm in a free trade area or or a preferential trade area, you, you might find that you know it isn't only tariffs where the, 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 there are laid down, I mean rates, but also all, all, I mean, procedures, I mean, may be standardised. In lots of free trade zones, the, the uh, customs declaration is actually a standard form. So you, you can't actually, um, I, I mean, actually simplify the, 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 that. So even though I say here that you, you, you can actually simplify forms, in practice, I mean, I mean, Regional regional agreements. I mean, I mean, may make that ext you know, ex extremely difficult. One thing that I mean, I mean, is key is if you can actually make it easier to import. I mean, low value goods, in, you know, import and export. I mean, that will help, I mean, small businesses, I mean, actually, especially. And if you can allow them to, I mean, make import decorations, I mean, I mean, as opposed to having to use, um, I, I, I mean, a shipping or clearance, I mean, agent, it, it will actually save them costs. One thing you find in developing countries, especially, is there are quite a few different agencies actually at a border and you have to do battle with each one in turn you know health um health i mean standards and also customs as well so if you can make it a single process where there is one declaration through a single window that, that goes to all agencies and there is a single process it, it will save i mean importers and exporters you know time and costs David, quick you can also you. yeah go on i'm mean, far away thank you um it, it seems to me like this could be an area of some tension 
I'm sure there are plenty of folks, uh, as you suggest, multiple uh, different parties who would like to collect revenues through these, uh, you know, uh, customs and, and borders. Um, do you expect that this is an area that we could expect to see some increases or decreases as, as might be uh, better for these small businesses as, as far as the costs of importing and exporting? Um, I am pretty sure all customs authorities are trying to make importing easier. I mean, importing and exporting easier. And I mean, I'm sure they're trying to do that across the board for large, I mean, medium and small businesses. But I mean, smaller businesses, I mean, lower value consignments, I am sure there is more scope there. I mean, almost all customs authorities have special procedures already for low value goods. Mm. You know, and if you, and obviously, I mean, a fair number of shipments are through I mean, couriers anyway, who have, who have streamlined processes. So, I mean, I will, I mean, I, I mean, I am expecting that that there will, you know, I mean, obviously IT is, is, I mean, moving every day, isn't it? You know, it is, I mean, developing. So I would expect that there to be, I mean, I mean, if you like, I mean, more streamlined procedures actually coming on stream everywhere all the time. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. I mean, lastly, um, obviously there is a cash flow dimension because businesses import and they can only sell the goods that they imported. So if you can find a way of enabling them to have access to the goods and sell them and to receive, I mean, some, I, 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 I mean, income out of sales, I mean, it makes it obviously, I mean, more attractive to import. So you could extend the availability of bonded warehouses so that the, the I mean, taxes and duties can be paid later. Or you, you can try to, I mean, do other things that, that will make it easier and cheaper as regards importation. But you really do need to work with, I mean, trade bodies if you're going to do that. I mean, next slide, please. Over to you, Liz. Okay. Well, thank you, David. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide because I realise that time is, is passing. So I'll just point out that there are, there are ways of trying to tackle the informal economy, which uh, is full of small and medium enterprises. Uh, whether or not they are formally registered and pay tax, uh, probably a lot of it they don't. Um, I won't go into all of these. This is, I think, worthy of a, a separate event, looking at how we can tackle the informal economy and illicit trade. But uh, you can see that there are a few things up there. Uh, amnesty, but don't use the amnesty too often. Uh, and how to improve compliance, especially through risk-based audit programs, and above all, especially for, well, for all countries, an anti-corruption strategy. I think no country is absolutely free of corruption, but that is um, a major issue in dealings between customs and taxpayers and revenue authorities and taxpayers. So I won't say any more from that. Um, just move on to the next slide. Please. And um, new taxes. We mentioned earlier that there might be new taxes, might consider new taxes. Uh, they'll never be popular and they won't necessarily directly encourage economic growth, but they may be more acceptable than increases in the current tax rates, such as VAT or income tax. Um, Whilst I, I said they're not likely to bring in enough money to close the current revenue gaps, which are, I think, extensive, but they could make a useful contribution. And there could be scope to identify those sectors that have benefited from the pandemic, such as the digital sales, sales, use of uh, robots, delivery service, and subject them to an additional tax. 
luxury taxes. Uh, I know they can be progressive, um, but I would just say the luxury taxes that because of uh, the methods that people have for registering yachts and aircrafts, uh, these taxes can be quite easily avoided. Jewellery, precious metals can be easily smuggled. So it's not necessarily going to produce um, that much revenue. Uh, additional taxes on telecoms and e-commerce. Well, mobile phones have been found to have positive externalities in encouraging economic growth in developing countries. Now, it may be that governments want to sort of jump on board the bandwagon of extensive mobile phones, but is that the right thing to do if they actually support economic um, development? And then we have environmental or health taxes, which are becoming ever more popular. Taxes on sugary drinks, plastic bags, pesticides, single-use plastics, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, That's fine, new taxes are fine, but legislation should only be amended or introduced after consultation with the trade associations and other stakeholders, and that takes time as well as political commitment. And with the extent, depending on change options selected, more resources may well be needed, both to announce and administer options selected and develop targeted communications. All relevant staff will need to be trained in the new legislation and dealing with the new tax. This takes time as well as money and may divert attention from other, perhaps more important tasks. So, on to the next slide, please. And I think we're now back to David. Yes, indeed. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I have got four items there, but one and three are basically the same. If you're going to um, want to make any changes, they're going to cost money. And obviously IT systems are actually, I mean, I mean, actually, I mean, complicated and, and it will take time and, and I mean, and also cost, I mean, to actually change them. So it's all very well wanting to do things, but you have to recognize that A, you have to mobilize funds, and then you go, I mean, after that, that there is a time lag you know, before any changes can, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, actually, actually, I mean, before change is a, are able to be made, and then, I mean, at that stage, you have to think about publicity, and you have to think about how you communicate that. I mean, to the taxpayers that that takes time, and it could be costly, and you have to train staff. I mean, as well. So, all of those affect things, and then. I mean, as as we have listed there, if you need to update laws, if you need to change laws or or actually have, I mean, new ones, uh, the, the, that takes time. Um, if the, the, they are minor changes, it can usually be done fairly fast. But if they are, I mean, if they are, I mean, more extensive or if they are controversial, it can take a fair time for a legal change to go through a parliamentary process. Um, I mean, in a fair number of countries, they are, I mean, financially stretched and overseas aid will be, I mean, needed. If, I mean, in, I mean, order to fund these changes and overseas aid cycles often um, are I mean are are in fact extensive, and it will take you a considerable time to mobilise those funds. So, you know, even after you've identified what you want to do, there will be a time lag before you can actually do it. I mean, I mean, next slide, please. Right. Um, our conclusions and our recommendations. I mean, I think the key point is that every country is different. I think I've worked in over 30 
and they are all com all completely different. You know, it's all very well looking at, you know, England. I'm in France. I'm in I'm in Holland, and actually assuming all 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 are identical, but the your countries are not. And I am sure every American state, Ben, is completely different as well. Have different regimes, and and so the key point is that there is no single silver bullet. One size is not going to fit all. And every, you know, you, I mean, every government will need to look at options and come to the conclusions as to the best fit in their particular case. And you could have two countries which appear identical who come to completely different I mean, conclusions and absolutely rightly so because the countries are, you know, and the, Im the impact of, of obviously COVID and, I mean, on the business mix in in the country is going to 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 be different but the key thing is that i mean sme cash flows are dire now so you need to do something quickly however as we have just said there are constraints about how you can i mean how fast you can move and as Liz Sami mentioned a few minutes ago, you do need to consult with the business community first. You know, I mean, us as, as if you like, I mean, I mean, either tax administrators or a tax policy makers actually think we know, I mean, things that are good for business, but please ask them because we could be wrong. <laughs> But have, having embarked on a course of action, having come to those con conclusions, the, the actions ought to be extremely simple, extremely clear, and they have to be communicated so that no one, one is, is, I mean, actually under a misapprehension. And obviously, as Liz mentioned at one point, we have to be also careful about fraud. You know, it's all very well doing these things, but there are a few people out there who may seek to actually, I mean, take advantage. So I will stop there. I mean, have you anything, Ben? I mean, you would like, I mean, I mean, to add? Well, David, Liz, I when I read your, your paper, I, I knew you'd have a wealth of expertise and knowledge to share on today's webinar. And so I, I certainly uh, was not uh, wrong on that front. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing with us all this fantastic information for governments who are looking to support small and, and medium-sized businesses through taxation. And uh, I, I think uh, the value here is great. And I encourage all listeners to please read that article and, and, and take a look at it. Um, our, our hosts today uh, have been fantastic in making sure uh, the collaboration uh, has, been, has been strong between the International Tax and Investment Center, as well as uh, Tax Notes International in bringing forward these papers and, and, and these webinar series uh, over, over the last eight. And so I'd like to thank both of them for, for helping and, uh, and, and thank uh, Elizabeth Allen and David Child again for, for sharing so much uh, great information today. If anybody else has anything they'd like to add, please do. I mean, nothing more. Thanks, Ben. No, no nothing more from me, apart from to thank uh, the unseen person, our Diana, who is putting everything together and making sure all the technology works. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, please uh, reach out to uh, Elizabeth Allen and, and David Child uh, with uh, any questions on, on their expertise in this area. Thank you. <laughs>